I'm Alyssa Bostrom, for anybody who doesn't know me. I'm Assistant Dean for Graduate Student Professional Development at Graduate School, and really glad to welcome everybody here today um, to this uh, panel discussion on faculty careers beyond the tenure track, which is co-sponsored with the Office of Postdoctoral Services, the illustrious Mark Matheson representing and uh, video recording today, and also with the Duke Career Center. So what we'll do today, I'll um, briefly introdu introduce our panelists, but I think it's probably much more interesting for you to hear about their careers from them. I've shared with them a list of questions, uh, either that folks shared as part of the registration process or common questions that come up uh, for graduate students and postdocs. And, um, and so we'll kind of start there and then open the floor up for questions from you all. So um, we'll start with Denise, and I neglected to ask you, how do you pronounce your last name? Comer. Comer, okay, mm -hmm. perfect, great. Who is uh, Associate Professor of the Practice of Writing Studies and Director of First Year Writing uh, here at Duke in the Thompson Writing Program. Uh, she received her Bachelor's in English Literature from Virginia Tech, um, her Master's in English Language Literature and Letters from the University of Maryland College Park, and her PhD in English Literature from the University of South Carolina, Columbia. Patrick Harrison, who's to her left, is currently a teaching assistant professor and director of instructional development in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and he completed his Bachelor of Science degree from Aquinas College, and his Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy degrees in Social Psychology at uh, Loyola, excuse me, Loyola University Chicago. Welcome. And Claire Scott, who is uh, an alumna of Duke University, but and also UNC in the dis distinct uh, position, a uh, unique position. Uh, she's currently a teaching assistant professor in the Department of Germanic and Slavic Languages uh, and Literatures at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, her Bachelor of Arts is from Dartmouth um, and Doctor of Philosophy from the Joint Carolina uh, Duke Program in German Studies. So, welcome back. So to get started, can each of you, and we'll start with Denise this time, explain the expectations for your position um, as a teaching assistant professor or as a professor um, of practice or, or however that relates to your title. Tell us a little bit about what your title means in practical terms on a day-to-day kind of -day responsibilities basis. Okay, so I should first say that professors of the practice at Duke vary significantly, and so what I'll share with you is just for my version of the professor of the practice, and if you asked another pop, um, you might get a totally different answer, so don't generalize based on what I say, but for me, in practical terms, it means that I devote more time to administrative work than I do to research. And I would say teaching and administrative work is probably equal in my job um, responsibilities and effort level. And then, but research is is close to it. And so I think the difference that I think of with tenure stream colleagues is that research is definitely paramount, right? And you prioritize research above kind of everything else, and, and that's the the thing that's most rewarded. Research is very important to me, and I thread that through my teaching and administration. So I um, I teach one section of first year writing a semester, and then the rest of my responsibilities are administrative in directing the first year writing program, and so that means mentoring and supervising our cohort of 27 full-time faculty and making sure that all of the different uh, courses that we launch, which run 150 different sections a year, are um, exciting for students and um, in line with our learning outcomes, and I represent the TPP on committees around Duke and then I do research and writing studies. Uh, in addition to that, based on questions that emerge and come up that I find exciting. So I feel like I have a lot of flexibility and freedom with what I choose to focus on at any given time. Um, I will also echo what Denise is saying about uh, it being very different across departments and uh, even within the same college, uh, you, you know, you'll see different departments taking this uh, different ways. So I'm a teaching assistant professor. Uh, that term actually is fairly new at Carolina. Uh, it used to be lecturer and they've wanted to make this more of a, um, more in line with the research faculty, so research assistant professor, teaching assistant professor versus assistant professor. So there are kind of three tracks to go on there. 
um, the teaching professors, the teaching faculty in our department are generally responsible for teaching a 3-3 course load. Sometimes it's a 3-2 course load um, over the course of the academic year. And we also take on a lot of service opportunities, so mentoring undergraduates, um, serving on various committees. We are encouraged to conduct research, but it is not part of our review. It's not um, critical to us continuing on with, with, that, uh, with that position. Great. Um, I have the same job title. Um, but my work is a little bit different, it sounds, and so to echo what everyone has said, one of the things I think about these positions is that they do vary depending on where you are um, and you know, what institution, what department. Um, so for teaching assistant professor in German and Slavic, uh, it means that I'm teaching a 3-3 load. Um, usually it's uh, around two preps though, so uh, a lot of times I'm teaching multiple sections of the same course. Um, actually, in the fall, I taught three sections of the same course, so that was only one prep. Um, and that's how uh, the German department tries to um, soften that teaching load a little bit for us. Um, so it's teaching a 3-3. Um, and I guess the other thing that I'll mention um, is, since people ask questions about stability, um, I will say that I am on a two-year, nine-month contract currently. Um, that contract has the potential to be renewed, um, and that potential is really dependent on funding. Um, it's a little bit more limited in German than maybe some other departments in terms of that renewal, um, but there is a possibility of renewal and advancement, and I think that that varies year to year, and it varies department to department. Um, so. In terms of my job stability, there is a certain degree of stability there in that I have a full-time position and um, in a certain number of years in my initial contract, but there's also um, a little bit of instability built in there in terms of the renewal of, of that contract. Thank you. So for the next question, can we start with Patrick this time? Of course. Um, in pursuing your current position, was this kind of a conscious decision to pursue this path? Um, and a position that's not on the tenure track. And uh, can you tell us just a little bit about what you feel like helped you prepare for your current role? Sure. Um, so I will say it's half planned, half serendipity um, with regard to that. Um, I you know, went through grad school, was involved in research, publications, things like that. Um, but I think two years in, I had the opportunity to teach a course of my own absolutely fell in love with it. Um, it was just unbelievable being in the classroom, leaving just feeling like, wow, I may have made a difference today or something like that. So um, I, I told my mentors that and then they said, well, okay, well, let's, let's keep that door open. Let's you know, keep doing the research, uh, keep working on teaching. I ended up teaching 50, around 15 courses while I was in grad school, something like that. Um, I, I tried to take every opportunity that I could. It took me a little bit longer to finish, but I, um, I, I taught quite a few courses, and then when it did come time to start applying for jobs, I was looking primarily at liberal arts colleges because they really emphasize teaching more. And then I saw an ad from UNC, and I thought, well, that's interesting. We've got a major research institution that is devoting have a whole separate track to teaching. So there are more resources, perhaps. Um, you can build off on some of the research that your colleagues are doing and uh, integrate that in, into teaching. So um, I actually took that job ad to one of my mentors, and he's a positive psychologist, and he said, oh, you were born for this. Oh, <laughs> this, is, this is so cool. You should do this. And he's actually a, a Duke alum, and he said, and Caroline is beautiful. And, and so um, I applied for it, interviewed, and, uh, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, I already knew how beautiful Carolina was because so I had been here for a while. Um, but I, I mean, I think that coming out of graduate school, um, I, with the, the job market the way it is, I, I wanted to, to find a job. That was my primary goal. 
Um, and, and with the way the market is, I think that for a lot of people coming out of grad school, that is, you know, priority number one is, is find a job. And I, I wanted it to be a job where I was doing something um, that I enjoyed doing, where I felt like I was using my degree, I felt like I was being, um, you know, my degree was going to be productive. And so I applied to a lot of different positions in a lot of different faculty positions, a full range of them, um, everything from, from tenure track to, um, to lecture positions. And, um, and I think that I'm, I'm happy with the way that things turned out because I th the, this past year has been a really important learning experience for me in terms of my professional development. Um, when you are teaching more than one or two courses at a time um, in the way that, that graduate students tend to do, or you know, maybe not even a course every semester, which is, is common for grad students um, outside of language programs. Um, in a language program, I was at least teaching one course every semester, but that's not always the case um, for people in other departments. And so it was important for me professionally to teach a 3-3 load, I think. And um, particularly teaching a lot of these intro courses, courses at the beginning of the curriculum in your department where you're meeting maybe all of the students that are taking that intro course. And you're introducing your field to these students and thinking about curriculum and thinking about what do these students need if they want to advance in this field, if they want to potentially major um, in this field. And those kinds of big picture questions in terms of pedagogy um, is something that I think that this position has provided for me that I would not have been able to get anywhere else. And so as I look forward, I'm still not exactly sure what type of faculty position is going to be best for me, where I'm going to end up, because um, I'm still very young in my career and I'm still very open to lots of different possibilities at this point. But I think spending some time in this role has helped me to be able to talk about the kinds of broader curriculum level, um, level decisions that need to be made um, that is going to help me in what other kind of faculty role I ultimately end up in. Mine has also been part conscious and part serendipity. Um, <clears throat> twice in my life I've had to think about uh, an identity that I had taken on and uh, whether I actually wanted to continue with that conception of myself or not and um, being willing to honor where my passion was heading. So once was when I was an undergraduate and I, had, I was already a junior and was already in, um, focused towards business and accounting and was doing well at it and um, really, but what I loved was English. And my dad was like, you can just read on the side. You don't have to change your major. And I was like, no, I'm going to do what I love. And I didn't like not like accounting. It was fine. It just wasn't where, where I was really thrilled to be. Um, and so I did that without really having a conception of what I would what that would mean for, for a job. And so then when I became a senior in undergraduate, I decided, well, I still love English, so let me just study more of it. And I went to graduate school, and then I continued. And, when I taught, I really liked teaching. Um, but then in English, there are um, disciplinarily, there's English literature, which includes, of course, American literature. Like, so there's literature, I studied literature. But there's also composition and rhetoric, which is a subfield often of English, and now it's coming into its own kind of field. But um, when I taught, it was composition, first year composition. And that's that moment for me where I felt like, wow, I really did something. Something in the classroom. And so I had to shed an identity that time of like a um, tenure stream, 19th century Victorian literature scholar, right? That was what I was kind of like aiming towards and recognized that where I felt a little more excited was in working with um, newer writers in the academy and helping people learn to write and express their ideas and, and, and pursue their curiosity. Um, both of those times became like it, it was um, like a long process, and it felt really uncomfortable in those moments because the identity that I had already was kind of what I felt comfortable with. But um, since then, I've, pers I've one time went on the market for a tenure stream job, 
and it was in writing studies, so it was like tenure student in writing studies. But um, I didn't. Um, I got an offer, and I didn't accept it. I stayed in where I am right now because where I am right now offers me, in my opinion, and we'll talk about like family a little bit later too. But um, just a little more flexibility and diversity, and like what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I I love. The parts of my job I don't like so much, but like basically, like I do different stuff every hour of the day, and I really like it, and I get to think about all kinds of different things, and that's exciting to me. Thank you. I'm going to jump down for our panelists a little farther down in our list of questions and ask you all to talk a little bit, and I'll start with Claire's time sure. um, about your application and interview process. So like um, people, you know, they went through some of the tenure stream kinds of interviews. How do the interviews and the application process for your current job compare? And you know, what kind of analogies can people draw, or how can they prepare for the process themselves? Oh, um, in my field, the application process is similar. Um, you know, the, the basics are all there and the same in terms of you're still writing a cover letter, you're still doing these things. Um, you're tailoring them to teaching. Um, though, and I, I think that that's an important part of it, so you're, you know, sending a teaching portfolio instead of a writing sample, that kind of difference. Um, and, but, the, but the general idea behind the application is the same. I think the interviews where the differences are the greatest, um, in that for a lot of these positions, particularly um, depending on the length of the contract, if it's a you know, two-year, three-year contract, um, then there probably won't be um, the money in the budget for an on-campus interview. Um, and so it's important to think about that and thinking about the, the Skype interview or the in-person interview as your chance to make that impression. And so you have to make a first impression quickly um, and concisely. For my current position, the interview was a Skype interview that lasted 15 minutes. and so. You have to, and, and I was speaking multiple languages. I was speaking in German and in English. So you have to make an impression. You have to do it fast, and that enthusiasm needs to be there right from the start because there's not going to be two days for you to you know keep revising that impression um, like you have in an on-campus interview uh, in a, for a tenure track position. Which um, you now I've also done the on-campus interview because I still. Um, and applying for tenure track positions here and there, and so I, I've been through the on-campus interview process, and it's very different to have two days to make an impression than it is to have 15 minutes via Skype, and you know you gotta bring it all there. Claire, just to yeah. add on, is do you think there's any possibility that because you are somebody who is from the joint program, mm -hmm. that maybe you had a different experience, or do you think that 15 minute Skype interview was kind of standard? Practice. That was the, I went through the exact same process uh, for applying for my job that everybody else um, did. It was an open search. Um, so even though I'm still, I'm technically at the institution where I got my PhD, um, it was an open search position and um, I interviewed the same way that everybody else did. And um, so, I, you know, that was the process. Yeah. But it's, it's a good question because. Um, you know, it depends on the position sometimes. There are opportunities for, you know, picking up some teaching or lecture jobs from your PhD institution. But in my case, um, my job was in open search, so that was the problem. Interesting. I'll speak about our program and then I'll end with just me uh, personally. But our program has two kinds of non-tenure stream positions. One is a um, it's sort of a postdoc, but it's a, a lecturing fellow position, and we invite people for a full day of on-campus interview that includes an hour with the search committee, and uh, um, we ask people to visit a class um, rather than teach a class, and they have lunch and dinner and a tour, and so it's a more of a full experience. The other non-tenure stream positions that we have are more like mine, so they're POPs or regular rank positions, and for those we have um, a two-day interview, and we have a, um, it includes a workshop demonstration of how you would mentor people with writing pedagogy, teaching, teaching teachers how to um, teach. We opted not to do a research presentation again because it's not that research isn't important, it's just that it wasn't something we wanted people to necessarily feel like they needed to demonstrate, so they didn't need to do a research talk. For my own, I came out of 
my PhD program and applied for a postdoctoral position in teaching writing because I wanted to learn more about teaching writing and get broader exposure for different um, approaches to it. And so mine was at an annual conference, our conference in English is Modern Language Association, and so it was held in Chicago and it was in a fancy hotel with like a huge seminar table and um, there were like eight people around the table and me and um, I uh, prepared materials on teaching, so it was very focused on me as a teacher of writing, and I really liked the conversation. And it felt less, um, it felt more authentic to me to talk about that than it ever did to talk about Victorian literature research. Like, I always felt like I was trying to perform something about that or impress people, you know, and which signaled, I guess, a lack of confidence or a disconnect between where, where I really was in my head. Um, <laughs> I think this is a great time to highlight the differences because you're at UNC and you're at Duke and my experience was much more like yours with the two, two day, one and a half day on campus interview where I was flown in, taken to dinner, you know, monitored all the time uh, <laughs> to make sure that uh, you're doing everything right. So it was very, very similar to the tenure track um, interviews that, that I went through. Um, the main difference was instead of giving a research talk, um, I, I taught a, a large course on a topic that was just sort of given to me and could teach this course. Um, and then of course uh, we had meetings throughout the day with different people, um, both teaching faculty and tenured faculty. So I got a chance to talk to people about their research and what's going on. and and how they integrate that into the classroom, and also hear from the other teaching faculty about uh, job stability, what, what's the trajectory like, what's the growth like uh, in, in this particular position. Um, and then uh, I didn't have to go through this. Well, actually, afterwards, then I had to submit a, a lesson plan, so how I would set something up uh, to teach uh, uh, in this case, it was statistics, so a specific type of analysis. Now they're having student or uh, people coming, people who are coming in interviewing. They also do a teaching talk, so something more on the um, how you would bring active learning into the classroom and, and things like that. So again, I think it's just important to highlight, even though we're at the same institution, our interviews wow. were completely different. Yes. Yeah. So. I'm going to circle back to something that Denise mentioned a little bit earlier, and that is, um, starting with Denise this time, talking about what do you see as the advantages of your current role um, compared with a tenure stream faculty position, and, um, and, and whether there are any drawbacks as well. I can speak about the advantages of my position, the things that I really like. I can't really talk about it in comparison, though, because I haven't, um, I haven't ever had a tenure stream position, and I also um, what I really think foremost is like you've got to find a position that works for you, you know, in your particular context and what's exciting for you. So, so if, if, um, if a tenure student person were sitting here, they might say all these advantages for their position and that's great. So for me, um, what I like is <clears throat> um, that I had room and space to not feel pressured to produce, uh, in my case it's monographs, um, scholarly monographs, and it's at a, a a pretty rapid pace and with pretty respectable high impact um, publishers and, and presses and, and that felt uh, really stressful to me. And what I liked was teaching and I loved administration. I was really excited. I love committee work. <laughs> I love thinking about curriculum. I, I am excited by problems, um, even, even hard problems and challenging and uncomfortable problems are on some level to me really uh, exciting to, to work with. And I like doing different things, um, not only each day, but also across time, you know. Um, and I, my um, family relationships have been important to me, and I have felt like I have had time to feel like it's okay to prioritize um, not doing work sometimes. But in fact, not just sometimes, not doing work, it's okay. <laughs> so I have three, I have three children, ages, um, 9, 11, and 14, and uh, I have a, a spouse, and um, you know, that takes us, that's 
like a big operation. <laughs> so um, I have felt like my job grafts nicely onto that, and I have never felt um, really um, compromised in what I wanted to do with my personal life based on professional decisions, and that has been a nice kind of area of consonance for me. Yeah, I would like to echo that 100%. I, I think the main advantage is you don't have that pressure to publish, at, at least in my position, it sounds like your position as well, which is a huge burden, as, as you all know. Um, and I do feel like there is more time than my tenure track colleagues. I, I feel like there is more personal time. Um, I also take time for myself and relationships and I'm not going to say I, I never feel overwhelmed, but I, I, it, it's not the same thing as, as going up for, for tenure. I mean, obviously, you have to do a good job teaching, and you don't want to upset students, and um, you want to you know, carry everything out to the best of your ability, but at the same time, it doesn't feel quite as cutthroat as, as the tenure track. Yeah. Um... I think that for me the trick with teaching is that teaching work can sometimes fill up whatever time you give it and so I think that one of the, the challenges is, is managing that time and saying okay this is the time I'm going to devote to this and but once you do that and it's I think it's actually very easy in positions like ours to do that and say okay this is my time that I'm going to devote to planning these lessons and, and not to and cutting it off. Because um, teaching is one of those things that will fill the space. Um, because you can always tweak a lesson plan, you can always fiddle with it. And, and so I think that um, the key to kind of managing things in, in a heavy teaching load position is really setting out the time and sticking to that. Um, so I, I will say that based on, on what my colleagues have also said. Um, in my particular position, um, the limited, limited service requirement is what frees up time for me. Because um, with teaching a language, there's a lot of grading involved. And so the, the fact that I uh, don't have a service component or a strong service component in my position um, frees up my time to really devote that to, to the grading student work, which is a really important part of my role as a language teacher um, in terms of giving students lots of feedback about their work. Um, and as someone who is um, not quite fixed as much in my role, um, the challenge is finding time to keep up with the research that I still want to be doing at this stage in my career when I'm still considering the possibility of pursuing a tenure track career. Um, and I think that that's one of the, the difficult things is if, if you're not sure where you're going to end up and what's going to be important, then um, you know, finding the time to, to balance everything can be difficult. Um, and also, at least um, for me, I think that um, sometimes, depending on how many colleagues you have, and I think that this, how many people are at, how many lecturers are in your department, but in smaller departments like language departments tend to be, um, sometimes a teaching heavy position can be a little bit socially isolating um, from your colleagues in terms of you're not one of the, the tenure track faculty members um, and you're not a graduate student, you're kind of in this in-between space that um, can be um, can be isolating at times, um, particularly when you know you're in your office just grading student essays, you know, and you don't feel that connection to the rest of the department all the time. Um, but I think the 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 remedy for that is is of course seeking out those colleagues and seeking out the the other people that have similar commitments or you know in teaching heavy positions like you are and. There's only opportunities um, to do that. Thank you. So I think we've heard from the panelists kind of loud and clear that you know even within the same institution in different departments there are you know different titles that the titles you know mean different things. And so we have the teaching assistant professor Denise mentioned here at Duke in the Thompson Writing Program. There are lecturing fellows and professors of the practice. 
So for folks who are looking at job boards or you know, the MLA job list or, or looking at uh, the academic jobs wiki, what are some kinds of titles that people should be looking for if they're looking for roles like, kind of like yours, but at other institutions? And I'll let anybody who feels moved to answer go first. <laughs> Lecturer. Yeah, that's, that, that was the first one, one that yeah. came to my mind. Um, teaching faculty, sometimes associate director is another key term where you can have administrative responsibilities and teaching also. Okay, great. Audience members, what questions do you all have for the panel? Should I go? I, uh, for the weeks, you said you started doing an administrative uh, um, what did say? Uh, BA, is that what you said, and then got into English, or where did you get your background for administrative um, skills? So, did you get that? Yeah, maybe that was, yeah, I never made that connection, so I, I started off, <laughs> thank you, um, I started off an undergraduate in, at Virginia Tech, it was a, there was a school of business, and so and then you could decide, this is a long time, <laughs> you could decide which track of business you were on. So I was in the School of Business and I was heading in accounting was the focus I was doing. And there were classes on business management and that kind of thing that I was learning. So that might be part of why I like administration mm -hmm. so much. So, yeah. Did you not talk about it when you were applying for the the job? No, because my first job out of graduate school was this postdoc, and it was really centered on me as a teacher of writing and developing as a teacher of writing, and so I needed to talk about me as a teacher. And then when I had the opportunity, so then, so I have uh, only had the job at Duke. Um, I <laughs> came out of my PhD, and um, I waited a year for personal reasons with my family stuff. But um, then my first job was as a postdoc, and then I uh, kind of. I saw opportunities in the writing program at Duke for director of first year writing, and so I interviewed for that, but that was an internal hire. And then, um, well, then here I am still. So I came on board in 2000, and this is 17 years later. Um, so I haven't had, I did, like I said, I did the tenure stream search maybe about four or five, five years ago. So I interviewed at several different places um, on campus interviews for that. But I, I just couldn't find, I mean, Duke is a pretty compelling institution also, which is factors in it too, so um, I kept staying where I am. Mm -hmm. I will say, I've heard that from a lot of my colleagues who have been um, in teaching positions, too, maybe ones that got into it before it was sort of uh, as, as big as it is now, and find themselves 20, 30 years later, and they're in the position that they're still in their full teaching professors, I mean, I'll say I'm a pretty active scholar, so I've written um, several textbooks for writing, and I have already submitted an article two weeks ago to a journal, and I do, I, I am an active scholar, too. Um, yeah, of interest to folks in the room is that she has a book on writing dissertations. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go. It's <laughs> just a dissertation. It's just a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment. Um, when you were talking about your family, um, it was really encouraging to hear you say that because that's my situation. I've got three kids that are around the same age, and um, and we're in the in the you know the final months of my postdoc right now. And it's okay. What are you going to do? And how do you you know continue to manage the you know family background and then still wanting to pursue some type of career? And so. And this was made available, I was like, ah, oh, I gotta go. <laughs> just to hear what they have to say. So I just wanted to say it was really encouraging just to hear all three of you speak about what you have been doing. It's hard to think about geographically, too, right? If you apply for jobs, too, you're often needing to cast your net really wide. And um, if you have family oh, we're not members married. and stuff like you know, yeah. it's, it's like a lot to uproot <laughs> yeah. you know, your whole crew for something that, in my field, anyways, um, you know, it's not like the pay is like incredibly high, you know, where I can say, let's move here, but we'll be incredibly wealthy, you know, it's not <laughs> 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 Yeah, 
Yeah, perhaps we should address that. Um, <laughs> because I'm assuming that, yeah, I mean, it is one of the, the, the questions. Uh, on average, the, the salaries are lower than tenure track. Um, there seems to also be a lot of variability, though, within that across departments. Um, if your department has a lot of resources or a lot of majors, um, so in psychology and neuroscience, I, I think we're the largest or second largest major on campus, so there's a lot um, it's more resources, and, and the jobs, I think, tend to be a little bit more stable. Um, that, that was kind of the expectation when interviewing. I, I said, well, I, I don't know. Do I want to move across the country for a three-year contract? And they said, oh, we expect that people stay in this longer. Um, that's, that's just kind of how the contracts are set up at this point. Which is a little bit different in my field, I think, and that's you know, why it's interesting to, to look at two different departments within the same institution. Um, yeah, I, I agree that I, I think the salaries are generally a little bit less than a tenure stream job. Um, not dramatically so, um, but I, I think that also part of the reason for that, and, and part of this is, speaks to what you were also saying, um, is that uh, my salary is coming out of a different part of the budget than, uh, than the tenure stream. So um, my salary is coming out of my department's teaching budget. Mm -hmm. And so that um, makes the, the way that my salary is calculated and the way that it is distributed, that money is distributed, is a completely different process than for people in the tenure stream. And that's part of what I think contributes to that variability. If your department was hiring a new uh, teaching faculty, what would their general range be within ten or fifteen thousand dollars per income? In the writing program? In the writing program we hire lecturers, um, so they um, are on now renewable contracts of I think three year renewable contracts and uh, Duke's lecturer ranks um, in many cases non-regular lecturers unionized recently and so those are renewable three-year contracts and I don't know what the salary is but I feel like I'm being recorded so I, um, if I'm wrong somebody please correct me um, I don't know I think there may be 45 to 55 thousand a year um, and and so the professors of the practice salaries are um, are uh, slightly higher than that and my understanding is slightly lower than it would be for tenure students get benefits and um, we get, I, I have a research fund which is nice um, because I can use that for um, going to conferences and buying books and being members of professional organizations. Um, I know in, in our department this is publicly available. Yeah, you um, can look up our salaries online. Right, right. Um, <laughs> it's, we bring in people at 55 and um, the nice thing is, though, um, they teaching opportunities during the summer are welcome. So that's an additional one ninth of your salary. Um, you can teach up to two courses during the summer. Uh, there's a lot of directorship positions. I'm talking about administration. Um, I took on the role of director of instructional development, where I help mentor grad students who are teaching and other faculty who might want um, different elements in the classroom. And that comes with a boost in that too. So. While initially it might not seem, you might say, how, how am I going to do that? There are plenty of opportunities to supplement, and again, the inherent flexibility in this position allows for that. Yeah. Um, German right now is um, bringing in lectures at around 42,000 um, with benefits, um, opportunities for summer teaching. Um, so if you teach in the summer, that's an extra couple of thousand dollars. Um, and then a research fund of uh, for conference travel and that sort of thing. Can we come back to talk about opportunities for advancement for a moment? So Patrick mentioned here some people have been, some colleagues have been there for 23 years, been promoted to full teaching professor, and Denise has experience, I think, going through a promotion process. Can you talk a little bit about what are the opportunities for advancement? I think you know, we heard about opportunities for more duties, and then how do you, how do you get promoted? Um, for, for me, I, I started off as an, uh, um, I was the postdoc, and then I was a lecturer, and then I became an assistant professor of the practice, and then I 
went through that with two cycles. I didn't, I got renewed. I think it was a four or five year contract and I got renewed and I didn't go for promotion at that time because I didn't feel like I had kind of done much to warrant the promotion anyways. Um, and then the second time I was up for renewal, I went for promotion to associate professor of the practice, which is where I am right now. And I'm in a contract that I think it expires in 2021. So it was a five or six year contract. And at that time I could choose to um, well, maybe it'll be chosen for me if they don't want to renew me. That's one choice. <laughs> um, if they if they are agreeable, then it would be I could go for renewal, which would be another cycle as associate professor of the practice, or I could try for promotion at that time, and then I would get um, another. Still, you'd get a renewable contract. Like even if I'm full professor of the practice, you're still operating on a five to seven year, maybe a nine year contract at some point. And the criteria for me again is just for me because it's my unit and it's my job and another 10 pops would have 10 totally different criteria for that um, but for us it's a combination of it's really um, I, would, I would say it's almost tenure stream light so it's um, you know administration service and teaching and just in different kinds of prioritization I would agree with that uh, it's very similar in our department too where um, we start off with three-year contracts um, then you get reviewed if your contract's renewed. I think it's another three years, and then after that, you can go up for promotion from assistant teaching teaching assistant professor to teaching associate professor. Uh, I'm not sure how long that lasts, but um, after a certain point, the contracts become longer and longer. You're, you're still fixed term faculty. Uh, there, as far as I'm aware, there isn't such a thing as tenure, um, but it becomes increasingly stable. Um, the salary does reflect that as you go from the rank, from the different ranks. Um, and again, um, I like oh, what, what you're saying. We're evaluated primarily on teaching, but also on service and administrative duties for the university and the department. When you say primarily evaluated on teaching, is that teaching evaluations, teaching portfolios, observations by colleagues, faculty colleagues? How does that get evaluated? Is it the same as like a promotion and tenure kind of situation? It's Yes, so all, all of the above. Uh, yeah. um, we are trying right now to sort of work on a way to make it, to make the evaluations on even playing fields, but it's it's very difficult to do that when you take a huge element out of it, like for the teaching professors, taking out the research element, when that would be uh, weighted very heavily for, for a tenured faculty member. In our unit, I mean, we're really focused on pedagogy and teaching it, so we use all, all of what you said is yes. So we have the, we, um, I submit my course materials, including my syllabi and course assignments, and then you have class visits where people and colleagues have visited and write letters, and, um, and then my own kind of self-reflection on my teaching, and then student course evals, and um, examples of student writing that reflect um, some kind of interesting thing that they're doing, and also my intervention as a teacher of writing, like where I've given feedback and students have done something important. So it sounds like very important to keep records of the oh, yeah. of student work. De-identified. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. <laughs> Claire, I didn't mean to keep you up answering the question too, if you wanted to. No, um, I mean, I don't think that I have much to contribute beyond what's been said. Um, I think that the process works very similarly in our department. Are you guys able to take graduate students? Is that one of the differences between tenure track and Professor of the practice today. When you say take graduate, yeah. do, do you mean bring uh, bring on as a as funded the chair or staff? Oh, okay. as a dissertation advisor. Yes. Uh, in our department, we're not a part of that process. Um, I have opportunities to mentor graduate students in teaching. Yeah. Um, for instance, I led a workshop on gender neutral language in the German classroom. Um, as a part of the new graduate student TA orientation this past year, so mm -hmm. I'm involved with mentoring graduate students as teachers, um, but I do not mentor graduate students in terms of dissertation projects. And I teach a graduate course, um, our first sequence of statistics, but, um, and I believe, I'm not sure about this, I think we can serve on committees if given mm -hmm. appointment, but, um, but we, we don't actually take students in as funded research assistants. That reflects my experience. I think that's a key difference. Yeah. Do you ever, uh, are you able to vote in faculty meetings or is that uh, ever a choice? I do. 
with a with your promotion or, or as once I became a regular rank. Um, and what does that mean, regular rank? I do get it means that you have voting rights. Okay. Maybe yeah. it means other stuff too, but it means <laughs> that was the distinction between um, non regular rank and regular rank. As an assistant professor of a practice or an associate professor? As an assistant professor of the practice I was regular rank and had voting rights. I don't currently have voting rights in my department. And I, I think this goes to an earlier question that we didn't um, go to with where taking a different kind of spin on it. Um, what are the downsides of these types of positions? One of the things that I was concerned about when I was interviewing, and I actually asked this question to the search committee chair, um, are we looked upon as glorified adjuncts, or is, is there respect, mutual respect? And, um, and, and I was told, no, that the tenured faculty really appreciate what the teaching faculty do, just like we look up to them as research faculty, um, and I found that to be very much the case. So in our department, um, you know, we are fully included in faculty meetings and, and decisions and search committees and, and things like that. So, but again, it sounds like interdepartmental differences. Yeah, I mean, and I'm, uh, we go to faculty meetings, but um, for uh, things like hiring decisions, for instance, um, we don't have a vote, so there's kind of a, a mix there where um, I, I do attend faculty meetings and I know what's going on in the department. I feel very comfortable voicing my opinion about things going on in the department. There's a real collegiality there. Um, but at the same time, I'm not involved on search committees and, and making those kind of decisions in the department. I assume if you're on a research track, you can serve as a, as a PI. And I can apply for grants and um, national grants and internal grants. I know there are rewards for doing that. Um, as part of the uh, criteria for promotion for for research, that would be considered to be, you know, it's good if I get a grant. <laughs> <laughs> That's a simple statement. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> good as, as opposed to expecting. Yeah, right. It, yeah, it's not expected. Although it is, I mean, research is it's just slightly like, in my case, I would say I, and it might be partly the way I've crafted the position because I really do like the research and I really do like the teaching and the administrative service work. And so I've crafted it, I, I have self expectations that I would have um, an active scholarly agenda and that in some cycles means grant work, and in some cycles means sending out articles and publishing differently without the money. But, um, I have colleagues where the expectations are different, and maybe they don't have as much an expectation of a certain number of grants or type of funders. And there's also grants that you can apply for for teaching. Um, my colleagues and I just applied for and got a, um, a large course redesign grant from the Center for Faculty Excellence at UNC, so there's also grants for teaching projects um, that are available at different institutions. Um, and so looking for, for those kinds of opportunities where you can have you know, a nice CV building line doesn't mean that it always has to be connected to, um, to you know, non-teaching related research. It can be pedagogical research that you're also um, you know, involved in and, and doing some kind of, of pedagogical project. You can also get funded um, and have that kind of, of prestige, if you will, I guess. Just getting funding, I guess, is a level of prestige. <laughs> yeah, a lot of our faculty are, are becoming increasingly interested in the scholarship of teaching and learning. And there are some grants out there. It's, it's getting bigger in our field. So you have people publishing in, in the, the teaching of psychology or different journals like, like that, uh, traveling to you know, some of our biggest conferences, presenting um, on these things. So. Um, you can definitely still apply for and receive grants. Um, there's nothing in our contract that, that says, well, I, I don't know, I don't want to speak yeah. to anybody else. There's nothing in my contract that, that says I cannot research and I cannot oh. do things like that. I, I could get a grant and become a PI, and I guess then maybe I could accept a grad student um, if that's something I want to do right now. <laughs> um, when you were in the job search process, what 
what things were you looking for, and, and maybe even more importantly, you know, what were the, the warning signs or like concerns that would come up with different job postings and the details of them? Can you mean a little bit? I mean, I guess in this, I guess you know, maybe I've been scared by like, the fears of these perpetual adjuncts or you know the the weight of how okay. much you're you're doing different gotcha. positions and how much your actual job ends up right. taking up your life. Particularly in this teaching field where my advisors have experience applying to these jobs. So. I mean, I think for, in, in my field at least, like one of the keywords is full time. Um, like, you want, you know, like ideally something full time with benefits is where you know that you're going to be um, in a position that's, that's not going to put you in that adjunct space, which is a, a really tough space to be in in terms of, you know, so you're not getting paid by the course, you're not, um, you know, involved in that kind of part-time work, so I think looking for full-time in, in the job ads is how you can kind of distinguish between what's an adjunct position and what's a position more like the ones that we have. Um, that's, I think, maybe a word to key in on. I, I would say just for me, it, it was about, this sounds kind of silly, but the way the job descriptions were worded, you could tell some were um, essentially tenure track positions, but they wanted to call it a teaching position. So they were sort of expecting everything, but by couching in the term teaching, they could pay a little pay bit less. less. Yeah. So, so you just want to be aware of what types of things are you going to be evaluated on? Yeah. Um, what's what's weighted? And again, the in, in my field, research, teaching, service, these are the big three. Uh, which one do they seem to be really emphasizing? If teaching comes up three times in the job ad and research only once, then you have a sense of what their priorities are then. Uh, I would just add to those excellent responses, um, like the length of con contract in terms of the renewability, but also uh, is it a nine month or 10 month contract or is it a 12 month contract? Mm -hmm. um, and then if, you, if you're if you evaluating a, a place on campus, you can really glean a lot about culture by looking at how people interact with each other and also the kinds of questions that they ask of you. Um, often those are moments where they're performing for each other instead of necessarily asking <laughs> you. <laughs> what kind of performance are they giving and why and what's motivating that? And people are idiosyncratic, of course, but um, I, think, I think culture shouldn't be underestimated in terms of workplace job satisfaction. I, I think the question that got me when I interviewed at UNC was, um, we want to make sure our people are, are happy. What, can you tell us why you'd be happy here. I'm just thinking, hey, wait, what you want? You, you want me to be, you're concerned about that. That's the first question. Wow, that, that says something as opposed to what can you do for me? So I think that was, for me, that was the instant this <laughs> Can you put up a percentage value for your teaching load and your research load and your uh, service load? So in terms of what my job description is, um, my job description is 100% teaching mm -hmm. um, and then that's pretty much the nature of my position and so anything in addition to that is, is something that I'm choosing to do um, out of my own um, you know desire professional aspirations um, whatever it may be so in terms of my job responsibilities um, I have no official job responsibilities outside of teaching um, my contract actually specifies the percentages, so now I feel like an idiot that I, I, I don't know that. It's, I, I don't remember that. It's, it, it's weighted heavily towards teaching. Um, service comes second. They expect you to take on uh, several service or administrative directorship roles, and then um, research kind of falls at, at the very bottom, at, at least for, for my position. But there are actually percents. I, like 10 for research or? Uh, probably less than that, probably oh, wow. five. It's, I mean, we're really not evaluated. It, it's seen as a nice feather in your cap if you can get publications and, and bring in 
um, and, and get your uh, undergrads or grad students involved in research projects. That's certainly encouraged, but in terms of it being a requirement for promotion, that's, that's not the case. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that because I often don't think quantitatively, and also it's being recorded. And <laughs> <laughs> you have to do effort certification, and so you actually are required to like certify where your effort lies with numbers, and so I. I I just can't answer that. Um, <laughs> so um, I think I I spend like in terms of like uh, you know a typical week or whatever I um, I spend about equal amounts of time with um, teaching and research and administration for me of various kinds, which includes, in my opinion, mentoring and committee work and um, that kind of thing. That would be the majority, more majority of my time. But the research and teaching is, is about equal and pretty high, pretty intensive also. I have a question for the three of you about kind of trend lines. So UNC has recently instituted this kind of title, I think Patrick mentioned, like teaching assistant professor versus lecturer. Um, but we, I think we've all read the articles about the adjunctification of higher education. So this kind of creation of professor of the practice or teaching assistant professor. Do you see this as a growing trend um, from, from each of your vantage points, which are different? Um, or do you see this you know, relative to, say, adjunct positions that are kind of cobbling together um, a bunch of different um, teaching you know, individual courses, putting those together? Or do you see this as kind of relatively stable because these positions are more like in between an adjunct and a tenure street practice? I think the numbers of these kinds of uh, fixed term contract positions are growing in German studies. Um, I think that in in our field you're seeing sometimes a, a tenure line at the university being replaced with you know, kind of one or two of these types of, of fixed term positions. I think that that is a trend. That's my impression also. I would say in our department this is, this is growing exponentially relative to how it was. I mentioned we had some people who have been in this position for you know, 20 years, something like that. that I, I think there were one or two people, and there was one brought in maybe 10 years later, and then in the last five years, the, I think it would be like six or seven positions. So um, I think it does depend on your discipline, how uh, popular that discipline or that major is. That, that will always they roll into it, but I, I don't see this going away. This, is, I think, is a win-win for both um, the professor and also for the university. It's a nice meeting. Uh, do you plan, you said you're a, a teaching assistant professor, right? Do you plan on, or can you apply for being a teaching associate professor? Right. Is that the next step? Yeah, so I'll Actually, next year I'll be up for my first renewal, and hopefully I can pass that step. And then I believe it's then after another three years, I believe then I can um, not only apply for renewal, but then for the uh, promotion. So is that how it is? You first apply for renewal of the same title, and then you can apply for the next title. That's my understanding. Sometimes it's restricted and determined in the contract that you're not allowed to go for promotion until you've actually been through one renewal cycle, and sometimes it's not specified, and if you feel like you have what you need to go for promotion, then you can. It just depends on what kind of contract you have. Was it your decision to stay, or to not get promoted the first step? Or the day assistant? I'm trying to remember. I, um, I really don't know. I feel like it's, it's likely that it was mandated that I needed to go for renewal instead of promotion and then you know there's custom that happens too so if you um, there's departmental and institutional custom and so if you you know sometimes it's customary that people expect that you stay in a position for renewal mm -hmm. you know in order to accomplish certain things and then sometimes if you stay too long that people like why you know mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know and I, I really um, I think I might try for promotion my next cycle, which is a risk because I just got promoted to, this contract mm -hmm. cycle was just my promotion to associate professor of the practice, and so I'm not sure if I'm 
not if I'm ready, I'm not sure I'm going to be perceived as ready to move to full professor of the practice and I need to evaluate whether I want to take that risk or not. Could they make a counter offer and be like, we can't promote you, but we can give you a renewal? I think you can get renewed. Yeah, you can be denied promotion, but renewed. Okay. Right, so it's a risk that's not catastrophic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's my understanding. I was just asking because I don't know if it was the imposter syndrome that stopped you from going for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that initial time? No, I was having, I was having babies. Um, okay. <laughs> so I just really, I was focused, my energy was focused in other areas and I've, um, I've loved what I've done and my, I'll say, you know, I, I've, I've changed a lot across the, um, my working life in terms of what I like and what I don't like and where I want to devote my time and, and so um, it's really hard when you're coming out of graduate school. I think we, um, my graduate program anyway, focused you towards like one goal, you know, and yours like streamlined towards like this one kind of ideal goal and it's really hard to um, embrace uncertainty and really um, deeply reflect on yourself and what you like doing and to be willing to take some positions that maybe aren't um, as prestigious as you might wish you could have gotten or could, should get or as monetarily rewarding. So there's so many factors and um, it's a hard, it's a hard place. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard. It's still hard. Mm -hmm. I think there is something about finding meaning, though, in the, in the position because I, I also uh, took a year. I did some adjuncting after I completed my PhD, and that was one of the hardest things ever because you work towards this singular goal. You have an idea of exactly what your life as an academic is going to be like, and then all of a sudden you're free and you can apply to <laughs> what, whatever it is you want, but. There are all sorts of sort of hurdles in the way and everything, and, and once you do find something that really fits with your personality and, and your skill set and everything like that, um, it's and, your life circumstances. and your life circumstances, yeah. it's it's unbelievable. But I really do believe that there is a, a type of position for everybody, and teaching faculty positions aren't for everybody. Not everybody would want to do that or um, would be happy doing that, but. What makes it right for you? For me? Mm -hmm. um, I, it, it was my first time in, in the, the classroom when I was in graduate school teaching a class and absolutely terrified. I had no interest in teaching whatsoever. I was going to be in the lab my whole life mm -hmm. and I stepped in front of a classroom and just words came out of my mouth and I like left my body for a while and it was, it was sort of weird. And then I, 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 I mean it, it wasn't that Crazy. But I, I did leave that day and I just had so much energy and seeing the looks on the students' faces, and this was, I think, statistics or research methodology, so, so saying, wow, wow. If, if, <laughs> if I can see that with statistics, maybe there's, there's something to that, and that really was, was the point where I, I said, I, I think teaching, and for my, to give my mentors credit, they said, well, let's keep every option open. Let's make sure that you're publishing. Let's keep you up to date on everything. Teach the classes that, that you want. But um, yeah, So it's essentially my experience in the classroom that really drew me towards this position. How about you two? What keeps you in the teaching realm? What makes it a good fit for you? Um, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm still figuring out where I belong. Like, you know, it's actually very encouraging to hear both of you speak because um, I still feel like I'm in the stage of my career where I'm still trying to keep as many options open as possible. I'm still exploring and, and figuring out, um, you know, where I fit. And, and so um, I will say that the thing that I like about teaching and, and teaching the amount that I'm teaching now is that I have the opportunity to meet, you know, because we're a small department, I have the opportunity to meet all the students in our department. Um, and I've, I have taught all of the students at the beginning level of, of German in our department at this point. So it's, um, it's a real feeling of, of being able to contribute to something when you can say I've, I've taught all of the students that are coming through this department and I have been a part of 
introducing them to this language and, and this field. And, and that's really exciting and, and really fun to you know, say that you know, I'm, I'm really you know, I'm, I'm doing something in terms of you know, introducing this field to, to these students. And, and that is really rewarding. Um, I, I love teaching and I think it's exciting and I like to learn from students and I like the conversations that are sponsored. I teach seminar style classes and so we have engaging conversations and I really like working with first year writers. I think these sentiments of um, feeling, you know, like you, your work is valued and that you're contributing in some way and um, doing something important or, or opening space for somebody else to follow their goals or do what they want to do, that's rewarding work and exciting. Um, and a mentor of mine, I was having a conversation with him <clears throat> about his career trajectory and he was remarking on one moment in his career, like a few year period, and he said that every day it was like going to a party for him. <laughs> every day was a party. And when he told me that, I thought um, that like that can't really be what it was. <laughs> 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 um, but then, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot, and um, and it is as much as work can be a party. Like it's, I have fun, I have a lot of fun, and there are really there are pieces of my job that are boring and that I or that are like that I really don't like, you know, or that are harder harder for me to, you know, make myself do. But it's it's pretty fun. I like what I'm doing, so that's what keeps me here. Is I'm enjoying. Well, you're also a little bit nervous when you go to a party, maybe too. So I feel like that's like even part of it. Sometimes, like I don't know, if, but for me, every time I step in front of students, there's that kind of energy that comes from, you know, anything could happen in a certain way because so you don't know. Yes, yeah, it does, and you don't really know. And, and that's part of the excitement of teaching is that you're not always sure what, what you're going to get back from the students this day because it is a dialogue. It is a cooperative process, and so. Um, I actually kind of like the party yeah. metaphor because there is, I think, an element of nervous excitement as yeah. well that is a part of, of my job, at least. Mm -hmm. well, I think for a final question to the panel, before we kind of break off into the opportunity to, uh, to connect one-on-one -on -one with our panelists, um, I would ask, starting with Claire and um, if there's a piece of advice that you would share with our audience for how to prepare to be successful in these kinds of roles. What, what would you advise our audience to, to go out and do as graduate students and postdocs? Um, I think the biggest thing is um, is time management, and with that, prioritizing your time. Uh, I think that one of the nice things about positions like ours is that there is a certain degree of flexibility in terms of the thinking about what you want to set as your priorities, what you want to focus on, what's important to you. Um, but with that comes uh, a, the real importance of, of managing your time and thinking about um, the way that you schedule your week and, and the way that you um, the way you take care of your time. Because I think that there's there's always going to be all sorts of opportunities um, and, and when you're at a university in a dynamic university like Duke or UNC there's going to be opportunities for you to do all sorts of amazing things um, and so it becomes a question of managing your own priorities and saying okay this is what's most important or the, my focus this year is going to be this aspect of my work and and having and setting goals related to that, I think, is the advice that I would give. And, and so working on those kind of time management strategies as a graduate student was really crucial for me. I would say two things. One is don't get discouraged or down because it is a tremendous time of change and transition and a lot of uncertainty. You don't know where you're going to be in the country or the world or anything. But yeah, just don't get discouraged. Look at it as, as a challenge. Try to approach it um, with the enthusiasm that's gotten you this far because if, if you're at this point, 
you are successful, and there's no, no reason to think that you won't be successful at the next level. Um, and then the second piece, uh, I would just take advantage of every opportunity that you do have while you're in grad school or while you're a postdoc, because it doesn't, certainly for me, didn't feel like I had all that freedom back then, but there actually is a remarkable amount of freedom and, um, I don't know what the word is, but it's something that once you get onto your career, you really have to be um, dialed in. When you're in grad school, yes, you have to be dialed in, but you can explore different things. You can take on different um, things. So explore as many options as you possibly can. I would say versions of the same thing. Um, I think be kind to yourself. <laughs> Remember what you're grateful for and what you're good at and what makes you happy. And um, be willing to think carefully about what you're doing to make it a deliberate choice rather than just what you're supposed to be doing because that's what everyone else around you is doing or that's what you've always said you were going to do and not being willing to accept that you might have changed your mind somewhere along the way. Thank you all so much for the thoughtful answers. And I invite the audience to join with me in a round of applause for our <laughs> We did advertise to everyone involved that this would go till 4.30 today. So this is a wonderful opportunity to follow up and connect with panelists um, who are physically here with us today <laughs> and then take advantage of their expertise and willingness to share today. So I invite you to do that now. Thank